put your ban on when you meet in the love of God. And that's where the Lord wants to take us this morning. And, um, I'm just so thankful for the word he's given me, which is exactly what Bruce just mentioned then. Um, so Lord, I, I just pray for your help, that I will not get in the way, Lord, but you will get into us, you'll get into our hearts, into our minds, and Lord, shake that which needs to be shaken in us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Um, two, two significant things happened this week, one was Adrian and Jill's wedding, and that was significant to them, and to us as a as a gathering and I, I was going to title today's message Don't Let the Honeymoon End with a dualistic approach one to them <laughs> and one to us uh, Don't Let the Honeymoon End it's probably appropriate for where we're going and this past week um on a more global significance, that the most holy day of the year in the Jewish calendar, or I'd like to say in God's calendar, because I think that's the calendar he goes by, Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, I think I've correctly said that, and um, which is a reflection of one's life over the past year. And I'm sure most of you know this, but I'll repeat it for those who don't. And sins are repented of at that time. And, you know, there's great celebrations take place of God's forgiveness. And basically you welcome each other in the name of the Lord, Shalom, and greet each other with peace and with blessings for the year to come. I think that kind of summarizes it, correct, Mike? Yom Kippur. So... The first day of October saw the lead into a new year and on God's calendar, followed by God's plan for his people, which God's plan for his people is always that they will humble themselves, repent, and turn back to him. That's his plan always. So, and make the necessary changes for the coming year. And I had a couple of verses on my mind. I'll throw this one out, but I'm not going to spend long on it. Philipp Philippians 3, verse 13 to 14 forgetting those things that are behind. Mm -hmm. We're, we've started a new year. I know it's hard for us in our Western mindset to get ahead around that, but this is a new year in the Lord's calendar. And we need to forget those things that are behind us, and not just the bad, but the good. Mm -hmm. Because the good can also weigh us down or keep us stagnant. And uh, forgetting the past and clear the table, as it were, of our minds so we can start afresh. And the question each of us need to revisit is a heart question today. Do I love the Lord above everything in my life? Or, said another, another way, what is the condition of my love for Christ? Do I love God, Jesus, above everything? And we're going to be honest with ourselves today because we started a new year and it's a time of reflection and repentance, right? The first Sunday for us of this new year, do I love the Lord above everything in my life? Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to get to that in some specifics soon. I want to give us a measuring tape today to each one of us so we cannot deceive ourselves into thinking we're in a place that we are not. And that's the nature of deception. We believe that we are in a better place than we really are. Mm -hmm. huh? And for the church at Ephesus, the fire of their heart had grown cold. The first church mentioned in the book of Revelation chapter 2 and it had, grown, it had grown cold, even though outwardly everything looked really, really good. And the 
church was growing in number so rapidly that the building could not contain the people. This is historically true. What happens is Paul has to spread the numbers into other groups and fire up new churches. Ephesus being the first, the mother church. And so Paul starts to plant other churches to take the overflow of the success of this church. We would call that a successful church today. Uh, they, they're commended for hate, hating the Nicolaitans, and if you go back in Dats, you'll see who that was. Uh, Nicholas was, was actually a Christian who had started a group and said to say he had become corrupted, his gospel, and that gospel was getting spread. In other words, false doctrine was getting spread. And Jesus commends them for hating that false doctrine, for hating that. So they were doing a lot of good things. Hard to find. When you read this church, you think this is the epitome of how church should look. This church has got it together. And, uh, and sitting in the midst of this incredible society, this pagan society that promoted sexual promiscuity, um, second to Sodom, uh, even in the church, as a way of worshipping mm. God. This gospel that Paul brought to it turned that city upside down. Just turned it on its heels, changed it. Impacted that city so much that other churches have spawned out of that church. And there you have the churches of the book of Revelation. So this is, this is the mother church. And in the final recorded message Paul pens to this church to the elders specifically he gives a warning a prophetic warning to that church and clearly they didn't take heed of it and it's in the book of Acts chapter 20 28 to 30 and he says take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you bishops that word bishops pastor or you could say elders whatever to feed the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. And I know that after my departing, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among you, and from among yourselves, men shall arise speaking perverse things to draw attention away to themselves. Scary words. Paul saw that in the eye of the Spirit. It's a prophetic word. I don't know if you ever realized that. Related to this church. Mm. And we'll never read another word from Paul to this church. This is last. Sad words. I mean, he had spent two and a half years giving his life to building this church. All the resources, all the money, all the time, all the energy. Imagine... Imagine, Bruce, putting all your efforts into the prison ministry and people come in behind you and destroy all the hard work you've done. Paul sees it in the eye of his spirit. He sees it's going to happen. He warns them, but they won't listen. And there's not another word said about this until the Lord himself, Jesus Christ, presents himself before John on the Isle of Patmos and calls him up to talk about the problem in this church. You imagine that. Jesus has got a letter for this church now. They won't listen to Paul. So they're going to listen to Jesus, surely. And so in Revelation chapter 2, verse 2 to 6, we read this sad, sad letter that is penned by John but from the mouth of Jesus Christ. And it says, I know your works. This is Jesus speaking. Your toil, your patience, your endurance. And how you cannot bear those who are evil. And you've tested those who call themselves apostles, and they're not apostles. And you've found them to be false. <laughs> we need that in today's church. How many false teachers and apostles are out there destroying the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? This church was doing it. They weren't afraid to speak. They weren't man-pleasers. And I know you're enduring 
patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. So they've still got a zeal. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. And remember from where you've fallen and repent. And do the works you did at first. And if not, I will come to you and I'll remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. In other words, I'm going to shut it down. And we know that's exactly what happened. Jesus shut the church down. So pertinent this for the hour that we're living in. It's not in the Bible as a story. It's in there as a warning for the church of this hour. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to focus on the detail, but I do think it does deserve time one Sunday to do that, of why Ephesus declined. And others, other than to say this, that the apostasy was caused, and it was apostasy, it was a falling away, by leaving the way that Paul had established the church. This great teacher had set this church on a strong foundation and uh, just very quickly, namely that the governance or the eldership of and leadership, according to Paul's instruction and to Timothy, um, what an elder must be, what a pastor must be, they had moved away from. Now, I won't go into detail, but I think you know where I'm heading with that, because Paul is very clear what an elder should be, who, what a pastor should be, who. And they'd moved away from that in a predominantly female-dominated Society. Number two, selectiveness in who they threw out as false teachers. In other words, churches invite teachers in to preach, teach. And they were very selective who they threw They threw out the Nicolaitans. But there was others they should have thrown out that they didn't. They were selective. And uh, there's reasons for that, as we know. And number three, using deceptive means to financially advance the church. Hello. <laughs> My goodness. This problem is still with us today. Number four, allowing a different Christ to be preached than the Christ that Paul preached. I can back all this up with scripture. This is not my opinion. Um, number five, and gossip had entered into the church. So that's a brief overview of why the church declined, why they left their first love. And remember that they still believed that they were going hard for God. They believed they were in love with God, just totally. So um, the prophet Jeremiah spoke of a time in Israel's history, same thing happened when the Hebrews had loved the Lord as one who loved his bride, he says. The Hebrews loved the Lord as one who loved his bride to be. But that faded away. That love faded away. And since love is the motivation drive behind obedience... We don't know how to be obedient. It's all because of love. How dangerous it was that they had left that affectionate love. Because when you lose your first love, you disobey. Mm. Automatically. Mm. just happens. If you're not passionately in love with the Lord, heart love we're talking about, you're in disobedience. There is no doubt. It doesn't matter how good a teacher, preacher you are, how big your church is. That's what's happened at Ephesus. So, in verse 2, this is, this is God speaking to the Old Covenant Church. Verse 2 of Jeremiah, that, that scripture I just quoted, he said, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me into the wilderness. Oh, nothing stopped you. you. You were just passionate to follow after me. Nothing drew you away from your passion for me. This is God speaking to his church. I remember when we first courted. That's what he's saying. I remember when we first met and we started to court and, and how much you're in love with me. But you've left me. And we see Paul has got the same problem when he addresses this church out of the book of Acts and John, through the message of Jesus, how he addresses the new covenant church. The same problem is still there. Jeremiah chapter um, 
Sorry, I haven't even got my text here. I'll, I'll give it to you after, Mike. Sorry. Uh, that's my bad note, note taking. So, um, there are three specific sins that the Lord is wanting his church in this hour to address. Now, right now, right at the beginning of this year before the consequences of delaying to do this will come. And these consequences are big. Uh, those three sp specific sins are this. The belief of false doctrine. The church must address the sin of false doctrine. And not be selective like the Ephesus church was. All false doctrine. Oh, and there's a lot of it. Number two, lukewarm Christianity. That sin has to be addressed in the church of this hour. Us, lukewarm. Number three, leaving your first love. Or well, man's heart has grown cold to the Lord. The last one being the consequence of the first two. Uh, is it chapter 33, Mike? I've got it written down somewhere else. I'll give you it later anyway. Um, so, all three are addressed by Jesus. All of these three sins are addressed by Jesus himself in chapter 2 and chapter 3 of the book of Revelation. And these three sins cost each one of those churches. And that day, their ultimate destruction. Despite the fact they're all warned firsthand by the Apostle John, um, their ultimate fate of these three sins is spiritual blindness over one's love for the Lord. I know that we all believe that we love Him. Mm -hmm. And that's a deception. And I'm going to try and give you a measuring tape today to measure your own life for me to measure my own life no, they believe they were loving God with all their life when they worked go back under the old covenant what's the commandment forget all the laws what's the only commandment there it is new covenant what's the only commandment say notice how he starts it with all your heart. That's where we're missing in the church. Because we don't understand the process of how to get to that. We've tried loving him with all different ways. With our minds. With our emotions. And that's where false doctrines got in. Because the only way you can love God truly is with your heart. The others are there to serve that. The soul, the mind, the strength are only servants of the heart. But you can't... How can I say this? You can't exempt that process to get to the heart, to love God from your heart. There is no way of exempting the process He's given. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Full stop, period. That's how we love Him. Okay, how do we do it? Through all your soul, through all your mind, and through your strength. That's how. The three serve the one. So what we've done in the church is try to serve God or love God with our emotions by bypassing our intellect, by bypassing our, our, our soul. Hence you end up with wacky theology or wacky doctrine or people falling down on the floor, rolling around, laughing, etc., I know something's going to be hard on us. Because we're trying to love him from our emotions rather than from starting with our mind. We've exempted the process. You see what I'm saying? You cannot love with your heart if you don't start by loving him with your mind. It's not possible. So these three obstacles, these three sins, the, the veils that will keep many believers out of the wedding feast. Mm. If you want to know what's going to keep the believers out of the wedding feast, this is it. These three. Mm. This is it. This is the big one. 
Great way to start the new year, isn't it? Wham! Out with a hammer. These are the three big ones. And there's a lim limited window of opportunity. This is what the Holy Spirit spoken to me this week. I didn't get this message from anyone. I truly didn't. This has come directly from the Holy Spirit. You can line it up with Scripture. This has come out of more than 50 years before the Lord in the last two weeks, this message. There's a limited window of opportunity that we've got to correct or right these sins. And there's a sovereign work underway right now in the church. It started. It's already started. Currently exposing false doctrine. This week, Joyce Meyer, and I don't usually mention names publicly, but Joyce Meyer's come out and repented of the false prosperity gospel that she's promoted. We know a few weeks ago Benny Hinn did the same thing. That's starting, that's starting, but be careful, this could also be a trap, so I don't mm. read too much into it. Mm. And it's not to say that their repentance isn't true. This could be a trap from the enemy because there's a lot of other bad teaching there as well that needs to come out and be repented of, not mm. just the prosperity gospel. But anyway, God is working hard in the church. You can see it. I mean, that's major because you're talking about someone who influences tens of millions of people. That's a major thing for someone to come out and take a turn like that. So you can see the hand of God's working. The sovereign works underway to expose false doctrine. It's necessary for two reasons. One, because of grace, because he is a gracious God. Before the hammer comes down, He's given grace upon grace to get this sorted out. And secondly, because it prevents man, and this is a big one, from loving God. Period. False doctrine stops man from loving God. Period. You cannot love God with false doctrine. It's not possible. I'll prove it to you. You cannot love someone when you don't know them. And false doctrine distorts the, the, the truth of God, who God is or who Jesus is, meaning it's impossible to know who he really is. Can you see it? That's why Jesus' words were, depart from me. I don't know you. That's what he's talking about. But Lord, we did miracles in your name. We did this in your name. I don't know you. What, what's he saying? You didn't know me. I don't know you. You knew another Jesus. The message you're practicing, hearing, doing is another Jesus. This is not me. You don't know me. I don't know you. That's what he's saying. So that's why this thing of false doctrine is massive. It's huge. And uh, Paul warns the church at Corinth that the Jesus he was preaching was very different than the Jesus others were preaching. We read that in the book of Corinthians. So the problem was these others were preaching someone who they did not know. They thought they knew him, like we've got in the church today. People preaching about Jesus, a Jesus who we don't know. And Jesus doesn't know. Who's this Jesus that preached? This is not the real Jesus. That's why there's a sovereign work. We're right at the end of time. There's the evidence, right? We are right there. And God's throwing everything at this to get this doctrine issue sorted out. Why? So they can know him. Because that's going to be the cry of his heart. I don't know you, but Lord, I had crusades and millions came to you and miracles happened. I don't know you. You don't know me. You know a different Jesus. You're preaching a different message. That's what happened to the Ephesus church. And the problem's worse today than it was in Paul's time. And many shrug it off as this. Oh, this must be a new move of God. That's what it gets shrugged off today as. What's oh, a new move of God? Or fresh revelation from God. That's what people are shrugging it off as. This is a new move. Now, many will say in that day, Lord, Lord. See, I didn't know you because what you believed in is not the real message. You thought you knew me. You, you didn't take, here we go, the time to know me. I'm sorry if that hits hard on each one of us. 
You didn't make the time. You made time for everything else. Your pleasure, your culture, your ministry. But you didn't make time for me. There's a difference between ministry and ministering to the Lord. <laughs> we know that, Brother Mike, out of the book of Ezekiel, sons of Zadok. There's a very big difference. You're more interested in your friends, your pleasure, your ministry, your culture, whatever, your family. Whoever loves brother, father, mother, sister, more than me is not worthy. Wife, husband. Do we know him? That's the question. We're going to really, on the first week of the new year, answer that question honestly. Don't get angry at me in saying it. Do you know him? Because it's better I ask you than he asks you. Because if he asks you, that means you don't. I ask myself this, this. This, to me, is the cutting question in the Bible. There is no scarier question than that. Mm -hmm. I don't know you. And it's better to get it right now than when we face it. Mm -hmm. I want to confront false doctrine today by exposing it. And the way in which I'm going to do this is by expanding God's word so that it will challenge you and me to change if we need to. And we'll start by looking at one scripture. I'll make it real simple today. One scripture that Brother Bruce mentioned this morning. And I'll ask you to allow the Holy Spirit to speak directly to your mind so that your heart may feel what the Lord can see in you. And if you got that. So your heart may feel what he can see. Because he grieves over his church. He grieves over its lack of commitment, lack of passion, lack of zeal, lack of wanting to spend time with him. He grieves over it. And so our hearts need to feel that grief. We need to understand what he's feeling. We'll look at one scripture. What's the greatest commandment given to us? One teacher asked Jesus. Luke 10, 27, love the Lord your God. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. So let's break it down to make it understandable. As Bruce said this morning, he, it was prophetic. I don't know whether you realize God's using you prophetically, Bruce, to say that we don't understand what it means. We don't. Church doesn't understand the scripture. The most important verse in the Bible, we don't understand it. <laughs> what does it mean to love the Lord your God with all your heart? It has to do with loving him with your affection. Or loving him with your emotions. Or loving him with your passion. Or loving him with your desire. So if any of those things, my passion, my desire, my, my emotions, my affection, is stronger towards anything else in life, including my wife, I'm not loving the Lord my God with all my and hence the saying, God is more glorified. That's why I brought this out the other week. In me, when I'm most satisfied in Him. Satisfied being displayed by my emotions, my affection, my passion. Or, and these, these words are like passion and, 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 and emotion and are like the rudder of a ship that steer the ship wherever it goes. Mm. And so, the ship is you, and your passion is the rudder. Mm. And if we have a passionless relationship with Christ, we have a ship that's going to be tossed all the time, and every wave is going to move it around until it's going to crash. You see the importance of loving him with your heart. This passion, this this overwhelming need for him. 
over, overwhelming desire to, to want to spend time, not just want, but actually do spend time. And that, that passion is what's driving me, my life. And to clarify here, it needs to be said that your passion or your emotion or your desire can only come from the development of the other three things that he mentions. Your soul, your mind, and your strength. This is why the church has made such a big mistake in this area. Oh, we've, we've had passion, we've had emotion, but it's not the passion of the heart or the emotion of the heart. It's of the mind. So we can whip up emotion or passion by music, for example. And people can get excited over God because of the music or the dancing or whatever, the performance. But that's head passion, head emotion. That is not heart emotion. That's not heart passion. And uh, to discern where our affection lay or our passion lay is to determine where we give our time to. So that cuts the crap out. That cuts out all the nonsense of jumping up and down and rolling on the floor and that, thinking that, excuse my language, but that thinking that, that that's passionate for God. No. That's not what he's talking about at all when he talks about loving them with your heart. To discern where my affection or my passion lay is to determine what I give my time to. Do I give it to my ministry more than I give it to my relationship in my bedroom with him? If I do, I'm not loving the Lord my God with all my heart. Do I give it to anything else? Same thing. But Lord, you, we've got people who have to feed them. Don't you know? Master, Master, there is only one thing that's necessary. And Mary's got it right. That's the heart. So, our affections follow what we treasure. And, and so, for our heart to love Jesus completely, we must treasure Jesus supremely. Correct? Uh, and so, our goal must be to make Jesus our greatest treasure. And the only way of doing that is by paying the price. Four-letter word. Time. T. I am the. You know the Mary and Martha stories in the same chapter as Luke. <laughs> That's, I didn't even realize. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? Uh, time. It's part of the same message. Time alone with the Lord. Quality time alone with the Lord. Huh? Time alone means time spent. What do I mean by that? Because we need to get it right. We need to be specific. Time alone or quality time alone with the Lord means um, time spent in His Word. It's the only way that we can develop our minds to align with truth. Mm. And if you're not good readers, become good listeners to good teachers. Mm. I'll be honest, I'm not a good reader. But I'm a good listener. I read, I read a lot, but I'm not as good as many. And uh, But we have to sift through what's good and what's not good. And sometimes we need to ask, well, we need some guidance on what's good to listen to. So prayer and singing to the Lord, they're necessary, but neither of them teach you to know Him. <laughs> Silence is wonderful. Wonderful. And necessary to reflect on truth, but silence will not teach you God's word. And without that, you cannot know them. It's not possible. And someone says, well, Jesus didn't have a Bible. No, because he was the Bible. <laughs> and uh, that's how his disciples came to know him. Because he was the word. He's the walking word. We don't have that privilege yet. Now here's a vital point to understand. Did you notice Jesus did not say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, period, 
Full stop. That's the end of it. That's all you've got to do. Because otherwise we're going to have this emotional roller coaster relationship with him. Because most people think what loving the Lord you go with all your heart, your emotion, your passion is out of your head. I'm excited because the music's whipped me up into a frenzy. It's not anything to do with that. The emotion and the passion has to come from the mind, from the Word of God that's renewed the mind. That's where the passion comes from. Mm. Not from the environment, the setting, the music, the, the smoke screens or whatever. He continues in that same verse and he says, he shows us how to love him. You love the Lord your God is more than emotional. It's more than your heart. Relationship. More than a relationship with your greatest affection is given to him. There are four necessary parts to loving God. And you cannot accept any one of them. Because if you do, take one of them out. You're not loving the Lord your God. <sighs> loving him with your heart is made possible by loving him firstly with the soul and the mind and your strength. And the soul, the mind and your strength will have a part to play. Their roles are to support the heart. Your emotions, your source of affection. So your affection or emotion is fed, as it were, by a correct understanding of God that comes from devoted, committed time alone, getting to know him. Now I know we shouldn't have to revisit the fundamentals of Christianity. But sad to say, the church has lost it. The church has lost this basic fundamental of loving the Lord your God with all your heart because it doesn't understand it anymore. And through his word comes a deep satisfaction which produces joy, as we saw the other week, and where joy is lacking, understanding is lacking. So if I don't have joy, the reason for that is I'm lacking understanding. Because joy comes from understanding. It's like, the light's gone on. Whoa, I see it. Now I'm happy. That's where it comes from. So understanding comes from seeking him until you find him. And finding him produces the joy. Mm. So if we avoid or limit sparingly spent time alone with him, in his word, we will not know him correctly and will deceive ourselves and others who know, uh, sorry, will deceive others who he really is. Here's the problem of the church at Ephesus. They start off good. They start off passionate. They want to talk about him all the time. They love him. You know, it's like you first get born again, you just you want to go and save the world. And you listen to lots of teaching and you go to every meeting and you're jumping up and down and, and you bang drums and you do everything and you're just giving it all. Well, what's happened is they have allowed deception in through bad teaching, wrong doctrine, which is stripped away their love. And they're not aware of it. To love them with all your soul has to do with your devotion. It's the way in which we choose to live. The choices we make. The behavior and lifestyle that we live by. And so our choices flow from what we treasure the most because we mirror our treasure. And um, loving God with our soul is about choices. It's about our obedience and our humility in our speech and our attitudes. It's not funny to be arrogant. It's not funny to be tough. God doesn't like it. We need to become humble. And, and <laughs> so loving God is, is about our speech. It's about our actions. It's humility. Third, loving the Lord your God with all your mind means a total renewing of the mind. We know that, Romans 12. One and two, and the language of the mind is images. So those images never stop playing. And to love God with our minds requires our number one, our reasoning. 
Come, let us reason together. There's a scripture to back it up, says the Lord. So as important as reason is, it should never trump revelation. So reason is the logical approach to God and how he's intersected our lives. And to love God with our minds means taking time to fill it with knowledge of his word so he can write, we can rightly agree with him. How do we agree with him if we don't have knowledge? We can't. What will happen is we will agree with the teacher or the preacher because we're too lazy to learn from him ourselves. Mm. And that's how false doctrine enters. Mm. It means loving him with our memory in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 3. I will tell of the kindness of the Lord according to all he has done for us. So we memorize the things that he's done in our life. And we, we focus, Philippians is another one where Paul talks about thinking on good things and pure things and lovely things. We focus on what he's done. We don't focus on the negative things that are happening. Because they'll destroy us, they'll, they'll pull us down. So we, we use our memory to focus on the Lord. It means to love him with my imagination. And, and, and imagination is important. Psalm 8.3. When I consider, that word consider means imagine. When I consider the heavens and the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which you've ordained. That's the psalm of speaking. When I consider, when I imagine, when thinking about your creation, God. What we think on means to love them with our strength. And 1 John 3 says, let us love not with words, not only with words or tongue, but let us love with action mm. and in truth. In other words, give God all you've got. Go hard. And uh, what we see, what we hear, wherever our feet take us, whatever our mouth speaks, we do it unto him. Mm. Loving God with our strength can often be construed as serving him in ministry. And it's not. It's nothing to do with that. It's not about what we can do for him. Not being able to see that they've forsaken this command of loving God with all their being was the Laodicean church. Mm -hmm. Next chapter, chapter 3. And uh, their reply is, we don't need anything. We're all good. What's wrong? Hey, Jesus, what's wrong? <laughs> We're all good. And uh, restoration or revival is always the heart. Of the Lord. And that's the Lord's heart. That his church be restored or revived back to this first command. The reason the church has got into this place of lukewarmness is its lack of taking his words serious. Consider them. Consider the words. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. All. Not some. All. Love the Lord your God with all your mind. What? That's a big one right there. Love him with all your soul. All of it. Not some of it. Not, not give him part or bring him into our life. Or Now we're married, we'll just add Jesus to it and things will go well. No, wrong. We're getting married because of him. Because we're going to serve him together. And dividing our time between God and what the world offers is not loving him. Being half passionate about the Lord is not loving the Lord. So giving the Lord one hour on Sunday to study his word is not loving the Lord. That's a big one. The church needs to get that today. And if I haven't moved, here's a big one from my intellectual awareness and correct thinking of him and about him to an emotional embrace of him, then I have not loved God with all my mind. Why? Because the mind... The mind has not loved until it gives its thoughts to the emotions. The mind has to say, here's what I've learned about the Lord. Take it, emotions, and the emotions respond. <laughs> That's the heart. So if you've got nothing to give, how does the heart operate? can't. See it? It can't. Now, experience with God must hold all components. That they must all work in harmony. Being one with God 
means all of man is unified with God. All, all of me is unified with God. My soul, my heart, my mind, my strength. And, and Do you remember that beautiful prayer Jesus prays for his disciples when he's leaving the high priestly prayer, John 17, I think it is. This is what he's talking about here. Mm. Father, my prayer for them is that they may be one with you as I am one with you. That's what he's talking about. You can't have your mind working for God and the rest of your body working against God. The whole of our being has to be in harmony or in unity with them. That's what Jesus is talking about. The disciples aren't there at that point. The whole of their being isn't loving him. That's why he's praying. And, and the degree of um, biblical passion or joy that we have for the Lord is determined by the time I spend with him. We can't escape that. I'm sorry whether you hate me for saying this. We cannot escape him. The time is the most important issue because the mind has to gain fresh revelation daily from his word in order to process from there to my heart where I can love him with that emotionally passionately it, in other words it should be changing my life outwardly you should see the change if I'm your husband or wife I should see you hiding away a lot more it's true. It's hard, but hey, I'm trying to prepare us for what's coming. And uh, so do you see it? That, that time spent in studying and correctly interpreting the Word of God, study to show yourself a word approved as a workman. Approved by who? That's a good question. That just comes out of nowhere. <laughs> approved by who? Who's going to approve it? God? Man can't approve whether your teaching's right because most of the church has got no idea what's right and wrong. That's why it's like the Ephesus church or the Laodicean church. It doesn't know truth. It's being deceived. It doesn't know how to love the Lord their God with their heart because the teaching that's here is wrong, so therefore the passion or emotion is going to be wrong too. It's going to be misguided. The wrong biblical interpretation shrinks our soul or our minds. An ability to love the Lord, it shrinks it. Wrong doctrine shrinks our ability to love Him. Just as watching movies, even good movies, sorry, not just bad movies, not just violence and sex, although that really. Why? Because you've only got one mind, I've only got one mind, and that mind is given for one purpose. To love the Lord of God. With it totally. So what I allow to go in there is taking up space. So I need to be really, really selective. It's not just about, oh, it's a sin or not. It's nothing to do with that. I think it's a sin to give our mind space to things that are not going to glorify God even if they're not sinful, if that makes any sense. Mm. It's troubled me. This is where this message stemmed from, out of a prayer I prayed nearly two weeks ago. I said, Lord, and it was in tears, why is it that most of the Christians I know don't spend the time with you they should be spending? Because I know, I know this is it. This is the key. Look at Jesus' life. It's not about knowledge for knowledge's sake. It's about knowledge for heart sake, so I can love him properly. And mm. honestly, I, I cried before the Lord in my bed. Why, Lord, is it? I think of my friends. Why is it? I can't think of many that are really committed to you with their time. Or oh, they're committed to this, to ministry, to whatever, but they're not committed to you. Mm. There's a difference. It took me 20-something years to realize that. I was so busy in ministry, I had a stroke. You know that. So, I'm talking about something that drives me to my room or, or, or the paddock or wherever my place is with him. 
And so that was my prayer. Why, Lord? I know that so many are not passionate about you, and yet this is the key. This is the scripture. Forget the whole Bible. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. How can you do that? The mind has to feed the heart. The soul has to feed the heart. My strength, my strength, my time, strength, all my energy has to feed my heart. And why is man kept so busy or his mind so occupied on things other than time alone with God getting to know him? That scary word. No. And here's your answer. Right here. Right now. Because man is not loving God with all his heart. That's why. It's hard. That's the big hand has come out. Or in Jesus' words, he's lukewarm. And I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. And so there's an urgency. You see what I've started with, that God is working in his church right now. There is a major urgency to cleanse the mind of lukewarmness in the church. There's also an urgency to mature, to correct doctrine, and to increase our time growing in truth, so that my emotions and my delight in him will grow. I know this is making sense to you. I know it is because it's truth. Truth will always make sense. And the purpose God gave man a mind is to use it for his glory and watching whatever. We need to be careful. And that was not, it's not a bad movie. It's, it's, it's happy. It's loving. It's all about that. Why would I give my mind over to any space, to something other than for his glory. That's how I live now. That's how I think now. Those who live with me know that's true. That's how I live my life. It's not that I don't want to watch stuff or go to the movies and do that. I'm not trying to be religious. I'm trying to... I'd rather my mind is full of him mm. than full of anything else. Why? So my heart can love him the way it's meant to love him. Isn't that what it's about? So um, you say, well, that's boring. It's really not. <laughs> it's really not boring. It's not. <laughs> so there's an urgency here. And uh, the mind of man is a treasure that we've got to value. We've got to value treasure our mind. It's the greatest treasure other than him. You've got treasure it. Prize it above every earthly thing. What we see, read, hear, do. Say it again. What we see, what we read, what we hear. Hear. It means be selective who you mix with. So, well, I mix with Christians. Huh? Half of them are not worth mixing with. You shouldn't mix with them. They're saying the wrong things. They're sowing seeds into your life, into your mind. You're having to combat that or push it back. Better to keep away. Go. There's another message one day. But, um, they all impact our mind. And loving God from the heart is essential to what it means to love the Lord your God. It's essential. So the soul, your strength, and mind are all means to getting the heart right and loving God. The mind, here we go, this is, this is good. The mind is the kindling, the kindling wood, huh, that fuels the fire of the heart. No kindling wood, no fire. What had happened? They grew cold. The hearts had become hardened, like cement. Hardens after a while. And that's what had happened. They'd, they'd grown cold because the fire was no longer hot. Mm. And the kindling wood is the mind that we should be feeding alone time with him in his word, in his presence. And that kindles the fire in the heart to get going. The passion in the heart. That's why he said, did you, did you notice these words? He said, um, I'd rather you're hot or you're cold, not lukewarm. <laughs> so uh, he's looking for hot, and the mind is a means of starting the fire. Think of the mind as a kindling wood. It's the means of starting the fire, but alone it can't produce the hot, because the kindling won't last very long. That's why just an intellectual relationship with God is not enough. 
So I just, even if you've got a PhD in theology, it's not enough because the heat from that kindling won't sustain the fire. Your heart is the fire. The kindling is what starts it, the mind. So one of the dangers we've got here in the modern church is the futile attempt to start the fire or the passion of the heart through music. It's futile. It won't work. It'll fire up emotion of the mind, mm. but it will not fire up the passion of the heart. It's different. So all it's going to do is trigger temporary emotion, an emotional response. Look, we all know this. We've all seen it. You can go into a church and music scrap. People are falling on the floor, crying, oh, Lord, I'm finished, repenting for, you know, whatever. And they go outside and half an hour later, they're just the same person they were. They come in. Why? Because it's not of the heart, it's of the mind. So when our focus is on music and a word of encouragement, that that's our meeting. In other words, I've been to churches, that's their meeting. Music, word of encouragement. We've shifted the focus from loving God to loving man. <laughs> it's all about man now. The music, the encouraging word. We can't rebuke the people here, they might leave. So we switch it from God to man. Now man's the priority, not God. So can loving God be rolling on the floor in so-called joy? I think this question was raised last week. And because joy is an emotional response. Okay, now we've all been here, so I'm not throwing steps at anyone. And we're to love God with our emotions. These emotions, not these ones. So the answer has to be no, because joy is a response from my satisfaction in Him, which takes my mind, my mind's intellectual understanding to fuel my emotions. So if I'm having a mindless experience, that's not what it's talking about. Do you see it? The whole movement out there doing this stuff. This is a mindless experience. Therefore, it's not coming from the heart. It's coming from an emotion. And it's opening the door to the enemy. Dangerous grounds. My mind fuels my joy in the Lord, which enables my heart to praise Him. So praise starts in the intellect as information that brings satisfaction that produces joy, that proclaims praise for God. That's the process. That's the process. And the praise for God is actually loving God with your heart. There it is right there. When I praise Him. I'm praising Him from my heart because it's, I've got it. The light's gone on. I've seen it. That's praising Him. That's loving God from my heart. So my mind, my soul are to serve my heart. They're not to function in isolated ways of loving God. And that's why mindless emotion produces disorder and Paul's right against it in the church. We know the scripture. <laughs> Let all things be done in decency and in order. <laughs> so loving God cannot be construed as ministry or going to church or prayer meetings or any of that. That can all be a byproduct, but it's not loving God. So loving God is a treasuring of him above all things from my heart which means the heart must have something to work with namely our minds passing to the heart correct doctrine correct doctrine mm. knowing him and then our emotions express that delight and that's what loving him with our heart is. So our hearts need to see his beauty, and find pleasure in that. Mm. That can only come from spending time in His Word. Getting to know Him. I think this is why the Scripture, you have need of no one to teach you. I think that's why that Scripture is there, because <laughs> there is a need in the church for the fivefold ministry. God has snuck the scripture in beautifully just to override that as your protection. Mm. 
Because God knew that the church was going to do exactly what it's done. Fall into lukewarmness. Fall into passionless. Not love him with their heart. So love is not tell me what to do and I'll go and do it. Which is why trying to love solely by our mind falls short. And it can never please God. And the same could be said trying to love God solely by emotions. So I'm going to wrap it up. Loving God with our emotions is commanded by Jesus. If you love mother or father, brother more than me, you don't love me. That's what he says. So by attempting to love... Uh, if, Sorry, if you love brother mother more than me or sister or whatever, you're not worthy. And worthy means if you don't have a strong emotional attachment to me more than them, you can't love me. So, but attempting to love purely by that emotion will lead you into heresy. And that's the problem with God. There's so much heresy crept into the church, like the Ephesus Church, the Laodicean Church, because we've tried to love him through our own ways, through our soulish ways, through music, through, through um, um, stirring people's emotion, drawing man's emotions. Is music important? Absolutely. It's great. But only as a means of loving God from my heart. Mm. Which means I've already spent a lot of time getting to know Him. And what I'm singing is from my heart. Mm. As an anthem of praise and gratitude and thankfulness and joy mm. for what I've already got. Because mm. I know I've got it. I've seen it. I've found the treasure. Mm. So remember that the kindling to the fire is your mind and the fire is your emotions or your heart. And let's love the Lord with all our heart. That is really an introduction of where the Lord wants to take us, I think, over the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. This incredibly vital scripture that is more important than anything else in the Word of God. That we love him with our being, with our all. And, you know, we should never feel, oh, this sounds so hard, and, you know, it's almost legalistic, it's requiring my time now and mm. my effort. Well, I guess if we don't feel like we want to do that, then that's really, really dangerous. That's really sad. That says a lot about, am I really born again to start one? Mm. Because Adrian and Jill got married yesterday. If Adrian said to Jill, well, it'd be nice knowing you, it was a great wedding, I'll see you in two years' time, she'd go, what? You, is that all you think I'm worth? Really? That, that's all you want? Okay, I'll see you in six months then. Or I'll pop in once a week. We do it to God. Lord, let us get it. Let us get the importance of this. That nothing compares to knowing you. Paul said it. At the end of his life, this master of theology, this this man that had more wisdom and understanding than possibly anyone else in your word. His cry is he wanted to know you. And it didn't matter what his circumstances were. That was his passion. Not to preach, not to teach, mm -hmm. not to do anything else but to know you. And so he did everything to know you. Everything. Well, Lord, let us get a hold of this. Because we don't want to hear those words, I don't know you. Lord, stir our hearts today with this truth that we need to spend 
time with you. Getting to know you. And what we fed on yesterday is not enough for today. What we learnt ten years ago is not sufficient for now. It will not sustain what I used to do. Or because I have a ministry, it doesn't sustain my love for you. Time alone will. Lord, stir our hearts. Stir our hearts. Draw us in to this endless love that you have for us. Eternal love. So we can continue to learn more and more and more of who you are. And do it with great joy and excitement. Let it be our focus, Lord, in Jesus' name.